This uh, morning before lunch, I am very happy to have uh, one of our first keynote speakers of the conference, Brad Frost, join us uh, from the United States and Pennsylvania. Uh, Brad Frost is known for his work in responsive design and specifically in, in his brand of that of uh, atomic design. Uh, he's worked with many agencies and companies around the world uh, implementing um, you know, modern U UX patterns and modern UX principles. Uh, and Joomla is starting to focus on this as well. If you didn't know this, uh, Joomla started its UX team this year. Um, and so this is a new focus of Joomla's focusing on, on quality user experiences and user interfaces for uh, the Joomla software. And so we're very excited to have uh, Brad Frost join us and talk to us a little bit about that. Um, so he's going to join us on stage here. And uh, after he's done, we'll have lunch right out here in the, in the lobby. Uh, and you can come back in here and eat or, or uh, have groups in any of our breakout rooms. Uh, there's tables in all those rooms. Uh, so I hope you enjoy that. But first, we'll have Brad Frost come join us. Thank you. Thanks for having me. This is uh, my first time in India. This is uh, really exciting, and uh, I'm really happy. Uh, I also really like how uh, my title apparently is a creative director, which isn't exactly true, but in my experience, creative directors get to yell at developers. So here we are. I get to yell at you for the next 45 minutes. Uh, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. I, I will go easy on you. Um, OK, so long time ago, there were these things called books. Anybody remember them, right, in books? All right. Well, these books had pages, right? So this concept of the page has actually been with us for the last couple millennia now. Uh, and as a result, it actually made its way into the, the language of the web, right? In its very early days, Sim, uh, ter, uh, Sir Tim Berners-Lee and his colleagues at CERN, right, were all looking for ways to sort of share their documents and stitch their documents together and link to their documents. So this notion of the page has been baked into the vocabulary of the web since its very beginning. And that has real impacts on how we go about doing our work and how we talk about the web. Right? We say, if you're doing a redesign project, it's like, oh, we have, you know, we need a 10-page website. Or Brad, how long is the home page going to take to make? Right? And this is uh, sort of troublesome. Because now, as I'm sure you're all aware, right, we now have all of these smartphones, dumb phones, netbooks, notebooks, tablets, e-readers, desktops, TVs, game consoles, all of these things now accessing the web, right? So talking about things in terms of pages, that actually doesn't really make sense anymore. Is anybody, anybody familiar with this, right? Many developers in the room have to uh, ask for three different versions of a Photoshop comp. Anybody? This is a safe place. It's OK to raise your hand, right? This is, this is what we do now to show clients and stuff that, uh, you know, this is what responsive design is, right? So we, we show what it looks like, what the home page looks like on a, on a desktop machine, and what it looks like on an iPhone and an, and an iPad. It's always those devices, too. It's like, uh, for whatever reason, designers really like their, their iOS devices and stuff like that, right? And we tilt them slightly to, ooh, <laughs> to impress the client, right? So this just doesn't work. This, this just does not work. This is nothing more than a tremendous waste of a talented designer's time. This just isn't accurate anymore. So. What do we do about this? Well, we have to blow up this notion of the page and, and quite literally also blow up our interfaces, right? Blow up this notion of the page, blow up our interfaces and really ask ourselves, you know, what are the web's Lego bricks? What are the web's subway sandwich pieces that we combine into all these different combinations, right? We're not designing pages. We're designing systems of components. Anybody use Foundation by Zurb in here? Anybody familiar with it or play around with it? Or, uh, what about Bootstrap? Where are my Bootstrap people at? Right? Yeah, lots of Bootstrap people. Right? And this is what we're talking about here, right? These UI libraries, right? This, this sort of kit of UI components that we could stitch together to make whatever we want. And I like these things. I really do, right? Again, we're designing systems of components rather than pages. And 
It's exactly what tools like, like Bootstrap do. Here's my problem with tools like Bootstrap, right? Whenever I'd watch sci-fi movies as a kid and sci-fi TV shows as a kid, I, would, I'd, I couldn't get this thought out of my head. I'm like, I guess just if given enough time in the future, we, we solve fashion. Just somebody somewhere goes, hey, how about from here on out we just wear jumpsuits? And everybody's like, cool, sure, yeah, that sounds good. I, I no longer need to wear these things. I could just wear a jumpsuit, right? And so you get this sense of sameness. But of course, that's not how human beings work. And that's not how our websites operate as well, right? So we have these, these tools like Bootstrap, which are great, but they're, they're, it's a single tool, right? Bootstrap is a single tool. And whenever you have half the internet using that single tool, they start looking the same, right? And that, if, if Nike and Adidas and Puma and Reebok and all the sort of major shoe brands in the world were to all redesign their websites using Bootstrap, they would look substantially similar, right? And that's sort of not what they're going for, right? So this notion that, you know, you know, these, these frameworks are great, but at the same time, they're, they're sort of singular things, right? They give you a lot of stuff, right? These tools like Bootstrap, they give you, give you a bunch of things that you could do, but you might not make use of all of that. But then your end users have to download all that extra stuff, even if you're not using it. On the flip side of that, these frameworks might not go far enough, and then you end up having to write a bunch of custom stuff anyways. Right? How do you work this code into your existing code base? Right? And lastly, you have to subscribe to someone else's naming style uh, uh, structure and, and, and all of that stuff, which doesn't always work. Right? So my friend Dave Rupert, a uh, developer in the US, uh, they did a, a redesign of Microsoft.com. And Dave talked about what they delivered to their client. Right? Rather than sort of a, a static set of Photoshop comps or something like that. He said that you know, responsive deliverables should look a lot like fully functioning Twitter bootstrap style systems that are custom tailored to your client's needs. Right? And the last part of that is the real operative part of that. Right? Custom, it's not about using a design system like, like, like bootstrap. It's about taking the time to craft your own design system that makes sense for your organization, for your clients, right? That solves your specific problems and addresses your needs. So that's what's given rise to all of these uh, front-end style guides or pattern libraries, as we call them. Uh, Anna Debenham has written a, a phenomenal book on the topic that's uh, actually quite cheap. Uh, you could pick that up. But the benefits of these pattern libraries are fantastic. They promote consistency and cohesion. Right? So you're not re reinventing the wheel every time. It makes things easier to test to make sure your components are, are performant and accessible and responsive. Right? It establishes better workflow between you and your team. Creates a shared vocabulary so that designers and developers and product owners and all these people all call your UI the same thing. Right? It's a useful reference to keep coming back to. And of course, it serves as this future-friendly foundation, this, this, this foundation to, to, gr to grow with and to learn from and to, you know, as you deploy it out into the world, you could bring a lot of those learnings back into the living, breathing pattern library, right? So as a result, uh, there's been a ton of these uh, uh, pattern libraries released in the open. Uh, Code for Americas is really fantastic. Uh, MailChimp, uh, the email, uh, sort of subscription service uh, has a fantastic one as well. Uh, Yelp uh, released theirs. We've actually rounded up a bunch of these things uh, on a site called styleguides.io that rounds up examples of, of pattern libraries and articles about them and articles about them and stuff like that. But it really all started with Starbucks, a big coffee company, right? They went responsive about three years ago. And whenever they released their new site, they released alongside it their style guide, their pattern library. And when you look at underneath the hood of this style guide, of this pattern library, they have things like this, right? Blocks three up is what they're calling this particular component. 
right? Here's this component. They're going to be reusing it a bunch of different places on the site. So they gave it a name. You're able to resize the browser and sort of see how it reacts on smaller screens and stuff like that, right? We have a featured list with a thumbnail, a, a headline, and an excerpt. You know, this, again, a common pattern. They're going to be using a bunch of different places on the site. Here's data tables. Here's a relatively simple data table with only three columns, and that'll squish quite nicely on the small screens, right? But what about this more complex one, right? How is that going to work on smaller screens, right? So I love these. I, th I think absolutely this is how we need to be approaching our design and development projects in this day and age, right? But there are some problems. One, they take time to create, right? It's an investment. And very often, I don't know about you, but I don't go into work every day going, wonder what I'm going to do today. <laughs> Maybe I'll make a pattern library, right? We're all under the gun. I'm sure you, you all feel the pressure to get stuff done and get things out the door, right? We're always behind. So, you know, sort of treating these pattern library projects as sort of a, a separate project than, than the main thing you're creating serves to be, uh, or, you know, proves to be a, a pretty uh, interesting problem. Very often, these pattern libraries are, are, are too abstract, right? They don't actually show how these patterns get used, right? What, back to that Starbucks example. Where does blocks three up get used? Like, what does that look like in the final design? Right? Very often, they're only seen as a designer or a developer tool, right? That's not meant to be used or, or, or utilized by any other member of the organization. They're only created uh, very often after a project launches. It's like, oh, let's get the main thing done, and then we'll go back through afterwards and start extracting patterns and make our pattern library afterwards. And then the last thing, and this is the thing that I really latched onto, is that I felt like a lot of them, even though they're, it's great that all these examples are starting to show up online, you know, a lot of them didn't feel very organized. It's just sort of this spray of, of modules or components. And it's like, yeah, I get it. Modularity is good, but at the same time, maybe there's a more deliberate way we can not only craft our, our final UIs, but also create these underlying interface design systems. So that's what atomic design is. is it's a methodology for creating effective interface design systems. And coming back to you know, the, sort of the inspiration is you know, basic nature, right? And it, like, uh, we have atoms in nature, right? Like hydrogen and oxygen. And they have their own unique properties, right? They're the basic building blocks of all matter. But at the same time, there's sort of this abstract concept. They're not, they're not often found on their own, right, in nature. But these atoms combine together to eventually form molecules, right? Hydrogen and oxygen com combine together to form oxygen molecules, right? which can keep combining further to form more complex molecules, which eventually keep combining together to form simple organisms, which keep combining together further to form more complex organisms, like a person, right? I did a Google search for, or a Google image search for people, and this guy showed up, and I was like, yes, you are, you are going in my slides. <laughs> Pretty representative of, of people. Um, but all matter in the known universe, I kept him in there, uh, all matter in the known universe is comprised of this finite set of atomic elements, right? That's a really beautiful concept, that the vastness, the richness, the beauty of our universe all sort of boils down to these raw ingredients, right? As it turns out, we on the web, we have this too. Uh, this is, uh, I think, a Facebook developer whose name is uh, Josh Duck put together the periodic table of HTML elements, which I think is pretty clever. Uh, so he's like, here's like our form markup, here's our, here's our uh, text markup, here's our, our table markup, and so on. I just think that was a, a super clever way of sort of organizing this stuff, right? But because we're starting with this same finite set of raw ingredients, maybe we could apply that same process that happens in the natural world to our interfaces. So that's what atomic design is. Is this, this, this sort of set of, of five distinct phases or stages 
that all happens sort of concurrently. It's not, uh, it's not a linear process. It's not step one, step two, step three. This is a, just a mental model of how we go about crafting our us user experiences, our user interfaces. So we have atoms, molecules, organisms, templates, and pages. So let's start with atoms, right? Atoms in the natural world, again, the basic building block of all matter, sort of abstract, right? They all have their own unique properties. They can't be broken down any further. Well, what are our atoms, right? What are our elemental aspects of our UIs? Well, things like labels, right? An input atom, right? A button atom. These are the basic building blocks of our interfaces, right? We can't break them down any further. But again, they're not terribly useful on their own. So at the molecule stage, what we do is we take those atoms and combine them, right? Now all of a sudden, we have this simple component. And that label atom is now defining that input atom. Now all of a sudden, clicking that button submits that form, right? So we have this nice little encapsulated piece of UI that we can inject anywhere we need a search form, right? So now at the organism level, what we do is we take that search form or uh, molecule and put that into context of, say, like a header of a website, right? And this header organism might be comprised of a logo atom, primary navigation molecule, search form molecule, but all of this collectively you know, forms this distinct chunk of interface, right? This distinct section of a, of a page, right? We see this on literally every website we go to, right? We see sometimes disparate elements like, like a header, wherever you have images and unordered lists and form elements all sort of working together as this unit. Or it might be like a e-commerce site, right? Wherever you have the same sort of product molecule repeated over and over and over again in the context of a product grid organism, right? So these organisms are sort of relatively complex components while, uh, uh, while uh, molecules are, are relatively simple components. So then at the template level, what we're doing is we take these relatively complex components and put them and do something that resembles a page layout, right? So this is, you're starting to see the final UI start to take shape. But the key here is that instead of, you know, this isn't the final stage, this is, what we're doing here is we're helping define the sort of content structure, the underlying content skeleton of our pages, right? So this is, you know, answering questions like, what's the size of that hero image, right? What are the lengths of those headlines, right? As sort of establishing the skeletal system of our content, of our user, user interface. And then at the page stage, what we're doing is we're taking that content skeleton, that underlying template, and pouring real representative content into that, right? So this is what it looks like, you know, after the content authors inside the CMS, like, you know, actually publish the content, right? It's sort of swapping out that, that sort of grayscale, that Laura Mipsum text and stuff, and pouring real actual representative content into it. So this is obviously a really important stage in the process because this is what your end users are going to see. And this is what your clients and your bosses and stuff like that are going to sign off on, right? But this is also a really important step for sort of validating or invalidating that underlying design system, right? Those underlying components, right? What happens whenever you pour this kind of image into this component? Does it hold up? Yes or no, right? What happens whenever you replace this sort of lorem ipsum text with, with uh, you know, 400 characters, right, and it wraps onto seven lines. Well, maybe we need to sort of go back through and solve that at a more atomic level. And it's also at the page stage that we can test and, demo and, and showcase sort of different uh, uh, instantiations of a template, right? You might have a home page, but then you also might have a version of that home page that says, your account's just been hacked, right? And so you need to display an alert banner on the home page, right? Still the same template, but it's a different flavor of it. It's a different instance of it. And your design systems need to be robust enough to handle that, to display all that stuff. So that's what atomic design is. Again, these sort of five distinct stages that all work together in tandem. It's more like a mental model or a philosophy, if you will, uh, that, that not only allows you to create 
good final UIs, but also establish along with it these deliberate sort of building blocks. And I've been working this way for the last sort of two and a half years. And I think the biggest advantage it gives me is this ability to sort of traverse between abstract and concrete, right? Not only am I able to see my interface totally blown to bits and, and you know, see all of everything broken down into their atomic elements, but I'm also able to sort of step through how all those puzzle pieces come together to form the final user experience. And I've also found that you know, atoms aren't tremendously useful, right? You sort of have here's our button, here's our H1s, here's a, this image or whatever. It's good, or, good as a reference. And then on the other end of the spectrum, we have pages, which are more there for re review, and again, sort of reviewing the resiliency of the design system. But the real sort of work, the real design development work and stuff happens these in-between stages, establishing our UI patterns and sort of stitching them together. It's also worth stating that, you know, this is an idea that was, you know, I'm a web developer, I'm a web designer, uh, so naturally, you know, I sort of made this while uh, uh, making web UIs, but this really could be applied to any user interface, right? Whether it's a native mobile app, whether it's Microsoft Word, or whether it's your bank's ATMs or whatever, any user interface can be broken down into this sort of atomic design, or using this atomic design methodology. So here's an example of Instagram, right, native app. Uh, if you look at sort of the atoms that make up Instagram, you have some icons, you have a couple different sort of text patterns, uh, and then you have two types of images, right? One for the user avatar, the other one which is the main sort of focal point of the app, which is the actual photo itself. At the molecule stage, you could see simple uh, patterns start emerging, right? We have sort of uh, the, the metadata, right? The user metadata around a photo. We have uh, the image again itself. We have uh, photo actions, right? As a little sort of cluster, this relatively simple component. And then we have sort of the, the commenting stuff. At the, organi at the organism stage, again, what we're doing is we're establishing these reusable complex components. And this is where you really see the meat and potatoes of the Instagram experience start forming, right? Where you sort of have this photo object, right? This photo organism, which is comprised of the user information, the image itself, and then the actions around that photo, and, and also, of course, the comments and stuff, right? And this is the, the component that's just stacked on top of each other, right? That scrolls for infinity. And then at the template level, we put that into the context of the layout. And at the page stage, we're pouring in real actual content into that sort of into those components to make sure that everything holds up whenever you have real user data, real user names, real photos, right? And, and at this stage, and again, this is where the page stage becomes so powerful, is that we're able to see and test what the interface looks like whenever there's zero likes and whenever there's 100,000 likes and whenever there's 75 uh, comments about the thing, whenever the user has uh, uh, a name, a handle that's four characters long versus 14 characters long, right? This is really powerful. So that's the, that's the over, uh, overarching mental model, the methodology for creating these UI design systems. In order to actually create this stuff, in order to actually work this way, uh, I created uh, an open source tool uh, called Pattern Lab uh, with a guy named Dave Olson, who's a web developer back in the, back in the US. What, what Pattern Lab is, is it's a static site generator. It sits on your computer and sort of stitches together these atoms, molecules, organisms, templates, and pages, right? stitches together these atomic design systems. And again, it's an open source tool. Uh, it's built on PHP, but that sort of doesn't matter, and I'll sort of talk about that in, in a little bit. Um, but it's really just here to help put these patterns together, stitch them together, with the end goal being to create your comprehensive uh, interface design system. Uh, provide some patterns to get started with, 
uh, and also has a few other tools that I'll talk about in a bit. Uh, but what it's not, what Pattern Lab isn't, is it's not Bootstrap, right? It's not Foundation by Zurb. In fact, you could actually use those tools inside of Pattern Lab, but Pattern Lab's just there to sort of help you stitch your UIs together. Uh, it's not language, library, style, or workflow dependent. So if you like using SAS, cool, go for it. If you don't like using SAS, that's fine too. If you like jQuery, cool, go for it. If you don't like that, that's fine. Uh, like Angular, sure, whatever. It doesn't, it doesn't care. Again, it's just sort of there to help you stitch things together. It's not inc incredibly rigid. Uh, lots of people use it and sort of change the naming of atoms, molecules, organisms, and all that. That's fine. It's also not just a pattern lab. Or it's not just a pattern library, uh, but it's also not a replacement for Joomla. <laughs> it's not a replacement for, for any CMS or anything. So you still need to sort of take your, uh, your front end code from Pattern Lab and actually insert it into the context of a content management system. So Pattern, but Pattern Lab, I've been using Pattern Lab for the last two years, two and a half years, to build production level front end code. Um, that sort of exists outside of the context of a CMS. We could have a conversation later, uh, perhaps uh, later on over lunch or something about sort of developing uh, in a world outside of the content management system in order to craft your front end code and then sort of port that in. So here's what it looks like uh, out of the box. Looks like crap. Uh, that was intentional, actually. It's just really helping drive home the point that it's like you still have to do the work yourself to design your own sort of the, the guts of your own system. But if we talk about this, we have things like, you know, colors. And colors are a very elemental aspect of your user interfaces, right? And you want those to be consistent throughout. You don't want 50 shades of gray. Or you don't want a bunch of different shades of, of red that are similar but, but just different enough. Right? So exposing those in the context of a pattern library is a good idea. Same thing with your typography, your font stacks. But also invisible elements like, like uh, animations. But then of course we have you know, paragraphs and block quotes and inline text elements and uh, you know, different image types. Here's our logo and hero images and, and avatars and icons and spinners and fav icons and different input types and things like that, tables and buttons and so on. And again, this is just a sort of a starter kit, and you could add or remove whichever things that uh, you need for your project. Then at the molecule stage, what we're doing, again, these molecules are sort of these relatively simple components. And what we're doing here is we're putting these things together. This is for a project I did for uh, Time Inc., the big uh, sort of magazine uh, company, big media company. And this is just one example of a molecule from our design system. So you have a little headline, little excerpt, and a timestamp. Pretty common pattern. We're going to use that a bunch of different places in our UI. Here's another example. Uh, you know, 400 by 300 image, right? little thumbnail image, headline, excerpt, common pattern. We see this all over the place. right? In order to actually make this, in order to make this happen, we're using a templating language called Mustache. So in order to make this pattern, the markup looks a little something like this, right? where we have uh, a block, and we're giving a block uh, name post. And then these orange bits here, these wrapped in little curly brackets, those, that's mustache code. So we're giving this a dynamic URL. We're giving it a dynamic headline and an excerpt. But the real power comes in this little greater than sign. right? What this greater sign uh, greater than sign is, is an include. It basically says, hey, I want you to go out and find an atom called thumb, which is that 400 by 300 image, and suck it into this particular pattern, right? And now we have this little encapsulated chunk of code, this little en encapsulated unit that we can now include in even bigger components using that same greater than sign, that same include. At the organism level, if you take something like a site header, right? so this was the, the header for Time Inc. And you can see there's a logo, there's a primary navigation, there's a sort of a search form that's tucked away. And if you look at the code for that, it's just a header tag. And then we're including our logo, Adam. We're including our primary navigation molecule. And we're including our search form. right? And again, using that same pattern, that same include pattern, we're able to include the header wherever we need it. 
So you can start to see what's happening, right? It's a, it's a bit like Russian nesting dolls, if you're familiar with that here, where it's like the little things are included in the bigger things, which are included in the even bigger things, and so on and so forth, right? So at this template level, what we're able to do is start stitching those bigger components together to form, this is the homepage template for Time Inc. So you can see there's a header organism, right? We have this big sort of hero area. And again, what we're focused on at the template level is the underlying content structure of this thing. So you can see these sort of placeholder images, lorem ipsum text. And as I scroll down here, you can see there's a few different patterns that we're repeating a few different times, right? And so the code just, again, sort of simply looks like a lot of these includes, and we're actually sort of wrapping it in a name. So I'm wrapping the hero include in, in a name called hero. And that gives us some, some capabilities that I'll talk about now. So at the page stage, again, what we're doing is we're taking that sort of gray scale sort of content scaffolding and pouring in real actual content. So in the context of our home page, we're taking this gray scale stuff and pouring in pictures of Beyonce. Uh, and if there's one thing I learned on this project is that people love Beyonce. I don't know, do people love Beyonce in India? But uh, it was like, it was the easiest way to get design approval from our clients. As soon as we put, showed pictures of Beyonce, people were like, yeah, this looks great, ship it. <laughs> so that's my advice to you. This is my pro, pro advice. Um, you know, if you're, if you're struggling on some projects, your clients are being difficult, just put in pictures of Beyonce, everything will be okay, I promise. <laughs> so, you can see, again, what we've done is we've replaced that sort of grayscale hero image with the picture of Beyonce. We replaced the, the lorem ipsum tagline with this tagline, moving people. We have this picture of an ice skater and with a real headline, a real excerpt. We've poured in real content into those blocks, into those components, right? And what this allows us to do is, again, not just show the client what, the, what their homepage is gonna look like, but it also gives us that opportunity to pour different content inside these components to make sure that they're versatile enough to, to handle it, right? And the way that we're doing that is, is uh, sort of taking some JSON, right, and overriding the default sort of JSON that establishes, here's that big hero image, here's this Lord Mipsum text. What we're essentially doing is, is overriding that thing. So uh, probably the people in the back can't see, but it basically says hero, image, source, and then we're pointing to a path, images slash hero underscore Beyonce dot JPEG, right? And so Pattern Lab will go, oh, okay, I want to replace the default uh, hero image source with this one. Okay, so that's the, the nuts and bolts of what Pattern Lab does, is it helps you stitch all these patterns together and then also gives you the opportunity to sort of swap in uh, dynamic content into that. It sort of serves as, as like a lightweight ad hoc CMS. And I'm not here, I, again, Joomla and, and other CMSs and stuff are, are incredibly important and essential for actually deploying your web experiences. But at the same time, during that design process, it's so incredibly important to be able to sort of pipe in dynamic content, real representative content, so uh, that you know, it's not too late that you find out that your designs that you got in a static comp aren't realistic, right, whenever you put actual content into that. Does that ever happen to anybody? Where <laughs> it's like you get handed these approved designs and you know, the clients approve them, and then they're saying, here, build this, and then you put real stuff into them, and then you realize that it looks like crap. And at that point in time, it's game over, right? Too late to sort of go back, you've already used your budget, and so on, right? Okay, uh, Pattern Lab also includes a little viewport tool. Now let's talk about this, because even in the age of responsive design, we see this a lot in our code. Right, 320 pixels, which is in iPhone 4 in portrait mode. 480 pixels, which is in iPhone 4 in landscape mode. Right, 768 pixels, which is an iPad in portrait mode. Right, 1024 pixels in iPad in landscape mode or desktop browser. Right, the fold. Oh God, the fold. Right, 
sort of annoying conversations we always have to have with our clients. Oh, it's terrible. But the, the problem is, is that the web is so much bigger than these specific viewport sizes, right? Every device manufacturer, every, you know, the, the web is intrinsically fluid, right? We can't think of the web, even in this responsive age, as just mobile, tablet, desktop. It's so much bigger than that, right? And it's incredibly myopic to, to just concern yourself with the popular device dimensions of the day, right? It's up to us to craft experiences that look and function great on any viewport size. So that's why uh, Pattern Lab, by default, uh, it builds in this little viewport resizer I made called Ish. And the reason why it's called Ish is that you click on the small button and it gives you a smallish viewport, like sort of small. And then you click on small again and it gives you another smallish viewport. It's like a range, it's, a, it's sort of like a randomizer. And again, the, the goal is, is to sort of help educate our, our clients, our colleagues, our bosses, that yeah, we're not just creating a site that's going to look good on an iPhone and work well on an iPhone. We're making an experience that is going to function well anywhere. There's also uh, something called disco mode. Uh, you turn on disco mode and it just bounces the screen around like crazy. Uh, and the clients love it. They're like, oh, look at it go, look at it go, this is great. But again, it's, a, you know, it's sort of cheeky. It's, it's not exactly like a practical thing. What it's really there for is to help educate our clients and our colleagues. Again, we're trying to not just craft an experience that, that looks great on, on whatever the spec sheet says or whatever. We're trying to craft something that's going to work well anywhere on present devices, future devices, and anything in between. There's also annotations uh, that we, we sort of chucked in here that gives uh, uh, people the option to uh, add annotations to any DOM element, which is pretty cool. So you can make an a uh, annotation for the, for the header or for the search form or whatever, and you can click on it and it'll jump you down to the, to the annotation. By using those sort of nested includes, right, that's sort of Russian nesting dolls approach, what we're also able to do is highlight which patterns make up any specific component, and also where this component gets used, where this pattern is employed. This is tremendously helpful. I found it in my own workflow, it's been absolutely essential. Because I'm able to say, okay, well, first of all, what makes up this specific thing? And it's a bit tough to read, so I'll read it out loud, but it, it, it says, uh, this block media link, which is what I'm calling that, it's, naming things is hard, uh, block media link pattern contains the following patterns. Uh, this, this square image, which I'm using CSS around the corners, I know it's a bit confusing. Uh, but then it says, this block media link pattern is included in the following patterns. It's included in the profile navigation, the section media list, uh, the account settings, and the edit account settings screens. So if I wanted to make a change to this component, I immediately now know where I need to go back through in, in QA and test and make sure that nothing broke. Right? This is tremendously powerful. Uh, there's a bunch of other stuff, code view, pattern status. We're working on a new version uh, where you could choose your own templating language. So if you don't want to use mustache, you want to use uh, Twig or something like that, you know, Drupal 8 and like other, other platforms or whatever, use different templating languages. I don't know if there's like a default templating engine with, with Joomla, but the idea is that you can sort of write your own sort of engine and stitch things together in whatever the templating language your software uses. So if you want to check it out, uh, it's patternlab.io. Uh, and again, it's all open source or whatever. And it's not, again, I'll repeat, it's not a substitute or replacement or a competitor of like Joomla or anything like that. It's actually quite complementary. OK. So how do we actually use this? I asked this question a while ago. I said, you know, what's the hardest part of responsive design, right? What's the hardest part? Is it responsive images? Is it you know, grid systems and breakpoints and stuff like that? Or is it people? <laughs> is it, you know, updating your process and your workflow in order to work better together? And overwhelmingly, people are like, yeah, it's people, <laughs> right? That's the hard part. So I had the opportunity to work on a few different projects, one for Entertainment Weekly, a uh, publication in the US, one for TechCrunch, which is a technology blog uh, owned by AOL and one for Time Inc. that I sort of alluded to already. 
Uh, and we had the opportunity to sort of work on these projects and really focus on what the modern design process looks like, what the modern web development process looks like. And the first thing we had to do is really reset people's expectations, right? This is how a lot of web design review meetings happen. Does this look familiar to anybody? It's like, time to review the new homepage, right? We're going to project it on a screen and write in the margin, right? We'll print out a copy. And so this is about as far from using a website as you can get, right? So Dan Mall, who I had the opportunity of working with on these projects, he says, you know, as an industry, we have this tendency to sell websites like paintings, when in fact we should be selling beautiful and easy access to content agnostic of device, screen size, or context. I just absolutely love how he stated that, right? And in order to change this, we have to kill this antiquated notion of the waterfall process. And this is very hard to do, right? You know what I'm talking about though, right? First stage of the process, you go through and you create this wireframe and you create like a 200 page PDF and you show that to the client and they're like, what do you think? And then they're like, they give you some feedback, and you might do like a round or two of wireframes. And then the wireframe person hands that off to the visual designer. And the visual designer goes into Photoshop, and they color inside the lines, and they apply color and typography and texture. And, and then we come back to the client. We say, what do you think? And the client's like, yeah, that looks good. Like, yeah, can we like move this a little bit, one into this a little bit? And they're like, sure, sure, no problem. And then we go back and we go into Photoshop and we come up with homepage underscore V2. And then we come back to the client. We're like, what do you think? And they're like, yeah, this looks great. That's exactly what I was thinking. Could we also do, yeah, yeah, sure, sure. And then we go back and then we do V3. And then we come back to the client and we say, what do you think? And they say, yeah, this is great. Can we bring a little more of that, like version one back in? And it's like, oh, yeah, yeah, sure, 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 sure. And then this happens again and again and again until eventually homepage underscore final underscore V17 underscore final final <laughs> underscore for dev review underscore final underscore V2 <laughs> dot PSD, right? finally gets approved. And only then does the visual designer quietly tiptoe over to the code cave and slips the designs underneath the door, right? And then they run away and they say, could you get this done in two weeks? We're already behind schedule and budget, right? <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> And then, of course, the developers come out of the code cave, and they pick up the designs, and they look at it, and they're like, ah, it's all wrong. You're all a bunch of assholes, right? <laughs> this happens all the time, right? I think one of the, the most critical components of, of sort of, you know, what's essential to a modern web design, web development process is that development is part of design, right? I write HTML, CSS, and JavaScript for a living, right? But so people go, oh, well, you're a coder, right? Go over and sit with those Ruby people. Whip us up some gems. And I'm like, uh, my mom's an art teacher, <laughs> um, right? I'm not, like, I don't, and, and there's different flavors of sort of front end development, of, of back end development, of programming, but I've never had a computer science class in my life. Right? I'm more comfortable around you know, the, the visual designers and the UX designers and stuff, even though I'm writing code. Right? But if you think about what HTML, CSS, and JavaScript is producing, at least presentational JavaScript, is producing a UI. Right? So instead of development being left off until the end of the process, what we need to do is be working in more close interdisciplinary teams all working and communicating and collaborating together, right? I've actually found it to be a little more like this, right? Where it's not that everybody's guns blazing all the time, right? Of course, at the beginning of the process, you know, you have uh, UX designers doing research and, and really sort of laying out like a, what a game plan of what the product or service or, or functionality is gonna do. But that doesn't mean that we can't get started on our jobs as web developers or that the visual designers can't get started on their stuff. So there's things we could do 
to sort of start gathering this stuff up and start establishing these pattern libraries. Uh, this is a tool called Stylify Me, which is pretty neat. Uh, what you do is you, you paste in your URL and you hit the Go button. And what it'll do is it'll spit back all the colors that make up your UI. It'll show you all your different font sizes and font stacks and stuff like this. And this sort of helps lay the groundwork for your style guide. Uh, another thing you could do is conduct what I call an interface inventory. If you're familiar with this notion of a content inventory, before a big redesign project, uh, you go through and you round a bunch of stuff up, all your different content. Well, an, a, a user inter, uh, I'm sorry, an interface inventory is like that, only you're rounding up all the unique UI patterns that make up your existing website. Right? So this is my bank back in the US, uh, who I hate. And you can sort of see why. <laughs> right? These are just some of the buttons that I've encountered on their site. Not exactly the most consistent experience, right? So the whole idea is that you go through and you do this exercise, you screenshot, you start grouping things together, and you really lay the groundwork for a future style guide, right? So what you're doing is you're sort of highlighting the inconsistencies, pulling out all those unique interface design patterns, and starting to have a conversation about them. Like, how can we make this more uh, cohesive? How can we sort of maybe merge these patterns together or get rid of these old patterns and, and just use these instead? Once we sort of are done gathering, then we go into finally starting to roll up our sleeves and establish direction. Uh, our friend uh, back home in Washington, D.C. Is a, is a kindergarten teacher. And uh, one day, one of her students asks, how do you make a website? And about our friend who's a teacher, she says, well, as it turns out, I know someone who makes websites for a living. And so they gave me a FaceTime call. And the six-year-old girl, Ava, asked, how do you make a website? I said, well. It's typically a good idea to sort of draw a picture, you know, sketch a picture of what you might want that website to be. And about an hour later, I get this picture message from my friend. And I looked at it, and I'm like, that's awesome. And then I looked at it again, and I was like, holy shit. <laughs> this six-year-old is better than 95% of the designers I've ever worked with. <laughs> This is incredible. Like clear labeling, color coding, proper hierarchy, freaking active states. She's six years old. Here's the home page. Right? Again, proper hierarchy, more active states. Her buttons are more consistent than my banks. Right? This is amazing. What I love about this is that I could build this, like right just from here. Right? I, don't, I don't necessarily need you know, some, some full wireframe or some full Photoshop comp in order to, to start working on this. Right? This is what we need to start doing, is instead of coming out of the gates with all these high fidelity wireframes and comps and then expecting only after those things get approved to start building, what we need to do is start just roughing out just basic functionality. What goes on the page and in where? Right? What general order? From a visual design perspective, instead of doing full Photoshop comps, we could do things like style tiles, which basically just sort of throw out some, some basic color swatches and typography treatments and things like that. All in the, you know, it, what, what these things are meant to do is not to be signed off on by a client, but rather to facilitate a conversation. Right? For the TechCrunch project, because this was a publication, we were able to go in and just sort of put together different font pairings together and, again, have a conversation with the client and say, do you like this? Would you, would you rather prefer this one? And we'd be like listening to their feedback to see what they value, what they don't value. Right? And from a development standpoint, I was able to start coding from day one of the project. And this is very, very uh, amazingly helpful when it comes to creating better work getting into the environment, the final environment, the browser, as soon as humanly possible, allows everyone to paint a more realistic pay, uh, picture of what that design is going to look like sooner. Right? And again, that requires no longer having the development, all the development, shoveled on at the end of the project. Because right? at the end of the day, 
if you're working on an e-commerce site or you're working on a, a big media site or something, you know you're going to have certain components in place, right? For TechCrunch, we knew we were going to have a newsletter subscribe form. We knew we were going to have site search. We knew we were going to be using a third-party commenting system for their comments. We knew we were going to have a, a contact form. So I was able to go from day one of the project to go in and start marking that stuff up. Didn't have to look like anything special, but I was just sort of getting that plumbing there. Right? This was a publication, so we were going to have things like block quotes and pull quotes. And I was able to set all that stuff up. Right? And by doing this upfront work, that freed me up later on in the process to truly collaborate with the visual designers, with the UX designers, to actually solve problems together rather than me going, hang on, I'm going to need three, three days to build out this page, and then maybe we could have a conversation. Right? So once we're done uh, creating that sort of initial di direction and getting things set up, then we're able to go in and start roughing out, OK, here's what's going to go on in this page. And again, here's the stuff that goes on the page and in what general order. And as soon as I see a little rough wireframe like that, I'm like, great, I could put that into the browser. So this is what the TechCrunch homepage looked like uh, like a week into the project. Right? Looks like garbage. But that's fine, because we know we're going to be iterating on this thing. We know we're going to be styling it. What I'm doing is basically just sort of stitching together all those unique patterns so that we could actually sort of play with it and evolve the design in the browser. And from a visual standpoint, we are able to sort of move into what, what uh, Dan Mall calls element collages, which is those style tiles sort of applied to a UI. And again, it's not full comps. Right? It's, again, just having a conversation with the client saying, what do you think? Is this going in the right direction? And this saves a, a huge amount of time. Right? We'd be able to show the client a header, and we'd have a conversation about the header. And we'd sort of go in, and I'd make that in the browser, make that in Pattern Lab, and start putting things together. And we'd tweak the layout and the, and the positioning of everything in the browser. And we'd continue to iterate over that component until it was done. And then finally, we'd have you know, sort of some patterns done, and the rest of the page still looks like trash. But that's OK, right? Because we're communicating with the client, they're able to see the progress evolve over time. And it's really only then that we start doing full comps. And in total, I want to say we only did like four or five PSD comps for the entire uh, TechCrunch website. And we did that comp, or did these comps, only after we established that initial sort of direction. Right, we had already established some of our main core patterns, and so we were able to sort of build these comps from a more realistic position. So this became our workflow, right? Designing and building, and designing and building, and looping those things over, right, again and again, making sure that we're getting into the final environment sooner so that we're not surprised down the road, right? What I found is that, you know, you could call this agile. You could call this whatever. It's not really agile uh, in, in the sort of official sense of the word. Right? But it really, what I mean to, to say with this whole process is that communication and collaboration trump whatever it is you, you want to call your process. Right? Actually having conversation. Actually, you know, either if, if you have the luxury of working designers and developers next to each other, means putting those chairs together and actually working on these problems together. And even if you're, you know, worlds away or whatever, that still doesn't mean that you can't actually have this collaboration. Uh, these projects were all done remotely. We were all over the place and traveling all over all the while. You know, it's all about communication and collaboration. And it really trumps communication and collaboration, trumps whatever deliverables you end up coming up with. Maybe, maybe you do need to make a bunch of PSDs, right? but maybe not. So this is our reality. right? This is a, sort of a humbling picture, I think. It's like we have all these laptops, all these smartphones, all these tablets, all these everything in betweens, and it's not going to slow down. right? This quote from Benjamin Franklin I think is really quite fitting. right? When you're finished changing, you're finished. right? This is especially true with a medium that's 25 years old, right? If you say, well, this is how we've always done things, right? It's like, what world are you living in, right? This software, 
Joomla didn't exist 10 years ago, right? So how in the world could you become so, you know, so it's up to us to constantly be challenging our best practices, constantly be challenging our own processes, our own biases, and, and really overcome that and look towards the future, right? That doesn't mean abandoning the past, but it just means, you know, being willing to challenge yourself, being willing to challenge the status quo. And for as hard as all this is, it is important to recognize what we do is a hell of a lot of fun. <laughs> I played with a lot of Legos as a kid. I don't know if you all did as well, but like, I sort of see this as sort of the same thing, right? Atomic design, building up these little sort of Lego bricks, right? Only we get paid for it now. That's cool, <laughs> right? And so I'll leave you with this. You know, we have 7 billion mobile subscriptions on the face of the planet right now. 3 billion people with access to the web. And here's the trajectory, right? Mobile is getting bigger, the web's getting bigger, and more and more people are, get, are using their, their phones to get online, right? These are two of humanity's greatest technological achievements. And where are we? Right? Right smack dab in the middle, trying to make all of this work together. I personally can't think of a, a better place to be, and I hope that you're as excited as I am to, to build for this future. So. With that, I'm writing a book on this topic of atomic design. If you want to buy it, hey, it's only 10 US dollars. You can pre-order the final book. Um, with that, thank you very much for your time.